Let me have a, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because you might be embarrassed, but um, I'm going to ask it to you anyway, so but just answer this in your head. Have you ever been in an argument that maybe escalated to raise voices, maybe even a little bit of yelling? That ever happened? You laughed, so I'm saying that means yes. Um, yeah, and, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't usually start off that way. Um, it, you know, you, you, kind of, you don't really typically just kind of come at each other screaming. But it starts with some, maybe some calm dialogue and a little bit of a disagreement. Then maybe someone fires the first shot, and it gets escalated. And, and then one, raise, one person raises their voice, and that usually happens. Uh, what usually happens next is then the other person reciprocates. And before you know it, instead of two uh, normal, rational adults, you have two grown children just yelling at each other. And nothing, and I do mean nothing, gets accomplished. All that's happening is two people who are kind of yelling. And here's the thing. I don't, I don't know if you know this, but once you get to that level, the rational part of your brain, uh, it stops calling the shots. It, it is no longer in control, and the part of your brain that deals with perceived threats, that part of your brain kicks in. Now, this is helpful, right? That, that perceived threat part of your brain, that's helpful, like let's say if you're being chased by a lion, right? Lion comes, run. I don't know if you've ever been chased by a lion. I haven't yet. I pray that doesn't happen, but if it, just word of advice, if a lion chases you, run. Um, so that part of your brain kicks in, right? But that's not good when you're in an argument and you both elevate and you both get to this defensive role and you start firing shots at each other. Now, you probably be, you're probably wondering, as in, why, why, are, why are we talking about this? And I'm glad that you asked. Um, and Because I believe... This is what we, we are experiencing today in our world. For, uh, for example, certain parts of culture are getting louder and louder um, with their beliefs, with uh, philosophies, with ideologies that continue to, to sort of just move further and further away from, from God's calling for our lives. And what I see happening is as culture gets louder, so does the response from Christians, but not in a good way. Not in a good way. One side will bring hate, and then, and then the, the Christian will, will, will kind of match that hate. One side uses demeaning language, and then the Christian, we, we match that with equally demeaning language. It, it's this back and forth, and, and I, I get it to a point. We want to defend our faith, and I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't, but what I am suggesting is that we do it in the way that Christ has called us to do it. I, I said this um, I, I posted this on social media because I was thinking about this sermon and I was preparing for this sermon. And, and so this was kind of the thought I had. And, and, and it's, it's, it was this. It's our world doesn't need an echo. Our world doesn't need an echo. You know what an echo is. Just in case you don't know, the dictionary defines it as a sound or a series of sounds caused by the reflection of sound waves from a surface back to the listener. Anyone ever experienced an echo? Raise your hand if you've ever heard an echo. Yeah. So here's the thing about the echo. It sends back what, it's, what has been sent in the first place. Okay? It's never like, hello, and then you never hear back, goodbye. You, know, you don't hear that. Or hello, you know, what's up, dog? You don't hear that. It's like, hello, and what comes back to you is, hello, hello, right? It, it sends back what, what was sent. So as certain groups and cultures send messages that are not grounded in Scripture, and, and, and what God has called us to, our response is we can't, they can't be sent back with the same tone, the same vitriol and anger. See, because this world doesn't need an echo. This world needs an alternative. It needs an alternative. Which brings us to our passage for today. If you, if you haven't opened up your Bible yet, I'd, I'd love for you to go to 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 4, verse 12. And today is senior recognition. Um, and seniors, you're kind of all over the, the, the audience today. And I, I am proud of our seniors, and, and I'm so proud of their families. It, it really does. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes I, I think, having, having lived through that myself, I think parents should walk and get a diploma as well, um, because we did a lot of the homework. Well, I take that back. My wife did a lot of the homework. My wife did a lot of the homework. Once they got past, like, first grade, I was kind of out uh, as far as all in math and homework and all that good stuff. But so, uh, and, and, and this, is, this, is, this verse is something that I think our seniors need to hear, our graduating seniors, but I also think it's something that we all need to hear, all of us. And so just a little background on this passage before we read it. 
This letter, it's written by Paul, the Apostle Paul, to, to Timothy. And it's considered to be, it's called one of Paul's pastoral letters. And uh, the other two are, are Titus and Second Timothy. And they're called this because they're written to pastors, to church leaders. And Paul is, is, is outlining their duties as leaders of the church. And, and their responsibilities, some of their responsibilities as church leaders is, is to defend sound doctrine and, and to maintain sound discipline within, within the church. And Timothy is told by, by Paul um, to, to stay in Ephesus and to make sure that there are, are certain men um, who, who do not teach false doctrines. That, that was something that was sort of creeping back into the church is they were teaching things that weren't true. And Paul addresses certain issues that are arising in the church, and he tells Timothy basically ha- how he should handle these things. And one thing you need to know about Timothy, which will make sense when we read this verse, is at this time he, he's considered to be what in this culture would call a young man. So most scholars, now when we think young man, some of us might go, okay, you know, hey, you're a little young man, or maybe a teenager. But in this culture, um, you could be considered a young man until you were about 40. Some of you, that's pretty good news. Hey, you're, you're still a young man. Um, but, uh, but a lot of scholars think that he's probably in his 30s, mid, mid, maybe mid-30s. And, and so what's likely happening, though, is that in this church, there are several, there are several people who are way older than Timothy, and they were going to use his age as an excuse to dismiss him. And so we get to this passage, and I want to read 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. I'm going to read verse 12 and then skip down and read uh, 15 and 16 as well. It says this, Don't let anyone despise your youth, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Skip down to verse 15. Practice these things. Be committed to them so that your progress may be evident to all. Pay close attention to your life and your teaching. Persevere in these things, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So what, what Paul tells Timothy is, is what our, our, our graduating class needs to hear and, and what we, we all need to hear. And what, here's what he says. You, you ready for this? He says, Timothy... Graduating seniors, church, set an example. Set an example. Timothy, the, 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 these, these older folks in your church, they're, 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 they're going to look, they may, they're going to try to look down on you. They, they may ridicule you. They may treat you like you're insignificant. They, they may not take you seriously. They, they, won't, they won't value you or your words. But here's what you do about that. Here's what you do about that. You set an example. Notice, he didn't say, you know what you do, Timothy? You put them in their place. Right? He didn't say, you know what? Well, if, if they escalate, well, then you escalate too. You go, they go strong, you go stronger. It's not Paul's instructions to Timothy. And that's not God's instructions to us either. The command here is to set the example. In other words, don't echo criticism. Don't echo negative treatment. Don't echo the fact that they may demean you or, or see you as unworthy. Don't, don't echo that they might treat you with contempt or scorn or make fun of you, which, by the way, is exactly what that word despise means in, in the Greek. It means to scorn, to treat contemptuously, to make fun of, to be seen without value, to think little of. You're unworthy of consideration. It's, it's, it's the word that's similar to, to, to this idea that, that you saw in the Old Testament, what, what happened when Samuel was told by God to go to Jesse's house to, to anoint the next king. And so, so Jesse brought all of his sons uh, to, to, this, to this event, everyone except David. Because David, who was the youngest of Jesse's sons, he was, he was thought so little of that he wasn't even invited to the house to be considered to be maybe God's appointed king. They left him working in the field. And that's what Paul is communicating here. They're, they're going to try to dismiss you. They're not going to, to think you're worthy to do what you're doing, but don't let them do it. How? By getting into it with them? No. By, by setting an example. In other words, don't, don't be an echo. Be the alternative. And if you're a believer, this, this should make absolute total sense to you. Of course we shouldn't echo culture. Of course we, sh- we should respond differently. Of course we should set an example. Why? Because we're different. To quote the great Prebham, hello? We're different. 
We're different. We, 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 we are made new through Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. Ephesians 4, 21 through 24 says, Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from Him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, listen to this, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So why would we echo culture or mirror culture when we've been transformed by Christ? Here's more about that. Romans 12, 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but what? But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. You know, I, I think it's interesting sometimes, and I know I can fall into this trap too, but I, I think it's interesting that Christians get mad at non-Christians for acting like non-Christians. Of course they're going to act that way, right? Because they don't, they, don't believe, they don't believe in Christ. They don't believe in what we believe in, so they're not going to be governed by what we feel like life should be governed by. But what is sad, though, is when Christians act like non-Christians and instead of being an example, giving an alternative, we fall into the trap of conforming to the world. But we're not called to conform. We're called to be transformed. Colossians 3, 2 says, Set your mind on things that are above, not on things of the earth. 1 John 2 Starting in verse 15, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now, this is not calling uh, believers, Christians, into passivity, but calling Christians to be, to be different. You see, fighting fire with fire doesn't work in, in, in this situation because when we do that, we just create a bigger fire. And what Paul reminds us is that when, when confronted with people who despise us, we come back with love and the truth of Christ. Because that's, as believers, that's who we are. We don't belong to the kingdom of the world. We belong to the kingdom of God. We belong to the kingdom of God. John 11, verse 44 says, The dead man came out bound hand and foot with linen strips and with his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to him, Unwrap him and let him go. Any of you know what, what story, what, what event this is? This is Jesus, yeah, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And, and why did Jesus tell them to unwrap him and let him go? Because he wasn't dead anymore. He wasn't dead anymore. He had on grave clothes. He doesn't need those clothes anymore. He's alive. He belongs to the living. He doesn't belong to the dead. Remember what the disciples saw when they first entered into Jesus' tomb? What did they see? They saw the grave clothes. Why? Because those were for dead people. But who didn't they see? They didn't see Jesus because Jesus wasn't dead. He was alive. And so we, we are made new. We are given new life in Christ. And so it's imperative that we act like ambassadors of the kingdom of God, the, the kingdom of life. We're, 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 not, we're not an echo, we're an alternative. We're, we're called to, to set the example. And so Paul gives Timothy some very specific areas which he wants, he wants him to represent Christ and how he wants him to represent Christ well. He says, in, in your speech, in your conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. The idea is, is that we, we surrender our lives to Christ. But sometimes I think as believers, and I'm going to say this because I, I am one, I are it, you know, whatever you want to say, um, I'm guilty of this. I, I want to take back, I, you know, I surrender, but I want to take it back because all of a sudden I want to, I want to push my agenda instead of really dying to self. But God word, God's word reminds us that we are not in control. It's really not ours to take. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, you are not your own. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are not your own. For you were bought at a price, 
So glorify God with your body. Now say, go back to your neighbor and say, glorify God with your body. Look at Luke 9.23. It says, then he said to them all, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him push his agenda, do what he wants to know. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Die to self, live for Christ in every area. And the first area that Paul mentioned is his speech. And there's a reason this was first, and I believe it's because our words, our words can cause so much damage. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it and indulge it will eat its fruit and bear the consequences of their words. More damage has been done to the cause of Christ by, by Christians who choose to use their words as tools of destruction instead of instruments of encouragement and truth wrapped up in the love of Christ. Our prayer should be what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 19. May the words of my mouth and the med- meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Matter of fact, let's read that together. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In the book of James, um, uh, he, he gives us, God gives us some powerful wisdom when it comes to words. James 1, 19 says, My dear brothers and sisters, understand this. And when it says understand this, it it means take note of this. Um, What what I'm about to say, this this is really important, really important. Everyone should be quick to listen. And in the context of this verse, what he's telling us to be quick to listen to is is listening to the word of God. Because remember, this is an oral culture for the most part. And so they're they're, going to be hearing, they have some, some material that is read, but most of them can't read. And so they're hearing these traditions and these stories of God passed on over and over. So be quick to listen, slow to speak, because you can't listen if you're talking. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Catch that? Human anger... That's what the world has, and too often, that's what we echo as believers. But notice what human anger cannot accomplish. It cannot accomplish God's righteousness. So that's why we have to be quick, quick to listen. We have to be quick to to, to take in the word of God and, and to hear God's wisdom, and we have to be really slow to speak and slow. We tend to get that formula backwards, right? Quick, everybody point to someone who gets that back. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. We get that backwards. We, 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 especially, I, is this where I see it a lot, is on social media. We get, we get mad and we speak or we post and we say, bring it on. Oh, yeah? Well, and well, oh, yeah? Well, here we go. And it's funny because, and I see you, because the, the Christian response looks exactly like the world response. And here we go. But that's not the example we've been called to give. Now, b- before you email me, okay, because I, I, I know you will, my email is mitchell.washington at gmail.com. Okay? So before you email me, I know what you're saying. Jimmy, Christians can't speak truth. Okay? So you're saying we should just sit back and take it. You're softy, Jimmy. You're softy. You remember Jesus? Jesus came in there and turned tables, right? Well, Jesus died on the cross too, so be careful how you use that uh, before you play that card. It's not so much that we don't speak, but we speak in such a way that our words bring people, point people to Jesus and not push them further away. I get it that truth is controversial. I get it that truth is is, is going to offend people, but our job is not to be offensive. Our job is to be Christ-like. We want our words to be pleasing to the Lord. Yes, truth is hard, but we don't need to make that truth harder by our tone, by our actions. Too many of us are ready for a fight instead of living like Christ. That's an echo, right? We've been called to be an alternative. Paul goes on to say, set the example in conduct. And this happens daily, uh, hourly, Minute by minute, reminding yourself of what kingdom that you belong to. 2 Corinthians 5.20, therefore we are what? We are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We don't act like we're ambassadors of this world because we're not. We represent the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and our conduct should be as such. 1 Peter 2.12, 
live such good lives among the pagans that, your Bible may say Gentiles, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. The reason our conduct should be Christ-like is because it's our mission to draw people to Christ. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation, and we can't be in the ministry of reconciliation if we're so busy acting like and living like the very people who we're trying to share Christ with. You see, a, a biblical message with an ungodly lifestyle is nothing but just blatant hypocrisy, and it never works. You may have heard me say this before, but the world needs an alternative, not an echo. Sure, there, there's, there's a greater than zero chance that the world will accuse believers of wrongdoing. It's happening. It's happening. It's going to happen. We're going to face it. The Bible tells us we're going to face it. But we have to remember that our conduct cannot prove them right, but must show them the different way. Our lives should always glorify God. Paul also tells Timothy to set the example in love. Man, this is, this is a big one. This is where I think this all kind of comes from because this love that Paul is talking about is not the type of love that we have for people who love us. Right? That's, that's good. That's easy. You love me. I love you. Great. You know, we're a big happy family, whatever Barney used to say. Th this love is, this is the agape love, and this is the love that God has for us, and he's called us to have for one another. This is actually a sacrificial love. Now, this has nothing to do with feelings or any kind of attraction. This is about a love that is for the benefit of others. It's a love that chooses. It, it, like, I make the choice. You make the choice to serve. And it's not dependent, up, listen to this, this is a tough one for us, it's not dependent upon re reciprocation. And it's exactly how Jesus loved us. Remember this verse, Romans 5, 8? But God demonstrates his own love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Notice, while we were still sinners, that phrase means that we wanted nothing to do with God. We weren't pursuing God. We, we weren't doing things that deserved his love, earned his love, not that we can earn it. We, none of that says, God, you, you know, I love you while we were still sinners. It just screams that, no, God, I'm, I want to be God. I want to be in control. I want to do my own thing. Yet God still loved us. He still pursued us, still served us, still sacrificed for us because he has agape for us. He loved us. And that's exactly what we're called to do. And, oh, by the way, given the strength to do through the Holy Spirit. Now, we tend towards that transactional love. I know I do. And so does this world. You love me, I love you. Do you agree with me? Hey, we can be friends. Do you hold my views, my opinion? Like, hey, love, let's, 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 we're, we're bros. But if you don't, I'm going to ridicule you. If you don't, I'm going to cancel you. If you don't, I'm going to talk about you. If you don't, I'm going to call you names. I'll do my best to make sure that you know how bad you are. But nothing about that screams Jesus. That's not agape. Agape says, I want what's best for you, so I'm going to do what Jesus did for me and love you the way that he loved me. You don't have to agree with me. You don't have to like me. You don't have to believe what I believe, but because you were created in the image of God, I'm going to treat you as such, as a person of worth and value. I'm not going to echo the sentiments that maybe that you're sending to me, I'm going to point you to Jesus, and I'm going to do that by seeking to be obedient to God and his call to love my neighbor as myself. I told you that was going to be a tough one. Paul next, he next talks about setting the example in faith. Now, in this context, it's not so much about what someone believes, but it, it's, it's more about one's faithfulness or, or unswerving commitment. The idea is as believers that we are consistently faithful and avoid swerving off the track or, or, or deviating from the course that, that God has laid out for us and, and, and the course that he's called us to live and, 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 and to live by. Um, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, know him and he will make your paths straight. Two very important commands in there. Trust in God and do not rely on your own understanding. Trust in God good. <laughs> Relying on yourself, bad. 
says, let's just try to make that as simple as possible. Think about all the things that you don't know, all the things that you don't understand. Maybe some of you, you know, you stood in your closet this morning for about 10 minutes trying to figure out what you were going to wear. Or I know when I go, you know, when I go to the store and look at a shirt, I, I change my mind 20 times before I'll ever buy it or not buy it. I need it. I don't need it. I like it. I don't like it. Uh, it looks cool on the mannequin, but it's going to look, I'm going to look like a dork wearing it, you know, or what, you know, all these things. And that's just trying to buy a shirt. But imagine life, dealing with life. The challenges, the hurdles, the obstacles, the decisions. And you know what? I don't need to face that with just this brain in, in my arsenal. That is not good. But what I need is, is I need God. We're pretty situational people. And, and, and so, but, but Paul says, listen to Timothy, you can't be situational. What you have to do is you have to stand firm no matter what. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In other words, don't get caught in, in culture's current because it's going to take you away from the path that God has for you. Timothy, your age doesn't mean you can't be firm in your faith. Church, j just because a, a world screams something else doesn't mean that we can't be firm in our faith. Don't let man's ideas, his perceptions, I ideologies, beliefs, don't let those sway you from the path that God is calling you to follow. See, what happens is, is, is what culture wants to do is get, wants to make God palatable. And, and, and so, you know, God can't be, God, God can't be loving and, 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 and be, and be a, a, a judge as well. That, that those things don't work. And so what culture is going to do is try to soften the edges. But as believers, we hold those things in tension. We know that those are both true of our God that he is a God of love and that he is the God who will judge all one day. And so we, we, can, be, we can be steadfast. We, we, we don't want to echo culture and, get, and drift closer and closer to conformity with culture. But again, God has called us to be the, the alternative. We can't be different if we're too busy being different. And lastly, Paul tells Timothy to set the example in purity. It's living a pure life when it comes to actions, but it's also a, a, a purity of heart, of motives. Check your heart. Remember, that's what Jesus did uh, on Sermon on the Mount. Look at Matthew 5, 27 through 28. He says, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Proverbs 4, 23 says, guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. Luke 6, 45 says, a good person produces good out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil person produces evil out of the evil stored up in his heart, for his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. See, what's in here will eventually come out in here, where we live. So just as important, it, it's important to act well, we also have to think well. And what, requ what that requires is seeing the world through, um, through a different set of eyes. We have to view people as God sees them. We have to love people the way that God loves them. We have to serve people the way God serves them. We can't sit on some, my, uh, some, some high and mighty throne and criticize and mock and make fun of and call people names and hide behind this force field that says, I'm a Christian and that's not how God wants you to live and don't want them to live. Yes, an ungodly world is going to live ungodly, but God has not called us to sit in judgment of this world. That's his job. He's called us to go and reach this world. Seniors, I, I hope, I hope and pray for you as and we, this is our prayer as a church family, that you would be solid in your faith, that your convictions would be anchored in Christ, that your identity would be found in who God says you are and that your life would point others to the extravagant love of Jesus. And church, that's my prayer for us too. This world doesn't, this world doesn't need an echo. This world needs an alternative. This world needs Jesus. And I hope and I pray that we would be that alternative, that when culture yells and screams at us, may we stand strong in our faith and lovingly, with truth and with grace, speak the name of Jesus into this world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. And thank you, Father, for calling us to something bigger and better than us. God, you've called us to be your ambassadors. And so, Father, I pray that you would give us 
the strength that we need, the ability that we need in order to do that. God, that we would represent you well in this world. God, we know that this world is, is, is moving farther and farther away from you, God, and, but that's, that's to be expected. God, your word says it will get worse before it gets better. But God, we, we shouldn't, as believers, just be a part of the, the problem, God, but what, what we should be a part of is, God, we should be a part of the solution, and you're the solution, and that's, that's, that's faith in Christ. So, God, I pray that today, as a church and as individuals, God, that we would seek today to commit today to be an alternative and not an enemy. Father, thank you for loving us, and thank you for calling us to be a part of your great family. And thank you, God, that you went first. You served first. You loved first. You sacrificed first, God, so that we could have life with you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.